gift we possess than time. And just the mere fact you're still breathing God's rare air means you're not finished with your purpose. Because if you were finished, you'd be gone. But you're still here. Because God has great purpose for you and your future and your life. Amen? So thank you for giving God your time tonight. Amen. I, I loved, where, where's my girl? Where's the, uh, where's my uh, singer at? The white robe. There she comes. Yeah, she's coming in over there. You know, I, I grew up in the Bahamas for about three years. And my mama and I were the only white people in a church of about 500 black Caribbeans. All right? That's my kind of music now. I, I kind of get lost in that stuff. I'll just, I'll just be honest with you. You know, that, that wasn't quite Calypso, but it still felt familiar to me. And man, I, I get in that stuff and I get to going and it, it, it feels pretty good. As I told you this morning, I was, Pastor Wolf and I has not been feeling well called over the last couple of months. I said, when can you come? And I was supposed to be in Swaziland today, South Africa. Swaziland is a small kingdom surrounded by South Africa, uh, not far from Mozambique. But I prefer not to be kidnapped, so I'm in Tampa. So, uh, no, I'm totally teasing, but it is a little politically unstable right now, so we canceled the crusade. We were looking forward to what God would do there, uh, but I'm delighted to be with you in Tampa. Amen. I'm glad to be here, and I, I thank you for all the nice things today you said about the Word of the Lord, because you know what's wonderful about the Word of the Lord is there's so many personalities in different situations that exist in this room. And yet the Word of God applies to so many of us in different ways. When I pastored in California, one of my favorite things to do was when someone left a notebook laying on the pew was read it. And I told the church, if you leave them laying around, your Bible or your notebooks, I read whatever's in them. So don't put anything in there you don't want the pastor to read because I'm going to read it. Because what I loved is when someone had notes about what I was preaching, and I would read their summation or their summary, and I'd say, I didn't even say that. And that's not even what I talked about. You know, or sometimes after you preach a sermon in revival somewhere, someone comes up to you and says, oh, that part about Daniel? And you weren't even preaching about Daniel. But that's what's wonderful about the Word of God. It's alive. And, and it ministers to us on the point of our need, where we're at, what we need to hear. And it's amazing how you'll turn it and twist it and interpret it to meet the need that's in your life because that's the way the Word of God works. That's why, in all honesty, there's never really a wasted sermon. And, and I'll be honest, I, I, I attend church on Wednesday nights when I'm not traveling with my wife and my family. I, I go because, and, I, and I'll be honest, I preach over 300 services a year. So if anybody ought to be saved, I'll probably rank up there a little bit. But I go Wednesday nights and I worship with my family midweek. And I go every Wednesday night to hear the word and to look for the nugget that's going to talk to me. To look for the part that's going to speak to my spirit. So, so I go purposely mining after what God would say into my life. And I hope that's how you come on Sunday nights and, you know, in, in a time when, when a lot of churches just have a morning worship set and there's not a lot of churches that have Sunday nights. And, and, and I hope you come in here and you're not thinking, oh, I have so much to do. I hope you're coming tonight saying, I'm ready to hear a word from the Lord. I, I, I'm ready to hear God speak to me. So... Let's just begin. Say this, when God adds time. Look at your neighbor and say, when God adds time. And you may be seated. I'd like for you to remember this statement tonight, and that is simply this. Tragedy is the fertile soil of the miraculous. So why don't you say it with me? Say, tragedy is the fertile soil of the miraculous. You see, every time God ever presents a significant opportunity, it is formed within the crucible of crises. It's connected to danger of some sort. It it's, has a great cost that it involves because there's not a single miracle in the Word of God that doesn't involve affliction. Barren wombs lead to miraculous births. That's how it works. Joseph is sold into slavery... And the result of that selling into slavery is one of the greatest examples of forgiveness 
in human history. The cruel Egyptian bondage culminates with the miracles of the Exodus and the Promised Land. And Jesus' gruesome death on a cross leads to resurrection. Hear me clearly. If you strip the biblical miracles of the spectacular special effects, a central reality emerges. Extraordinary moves of God begin with ordinary people. That's it. Strip the Bible of all the supernatural things, and the issue emerges. Extraordinary miracles begin with ordinary people. And the good news is this. You are not exclusively responsible for the outcome of your obedience. So I'm going to say it again. Extraordinary moves of God begin with ordinary people who commit ordinary acts of obedience. And extraordinary moves of God begin with ordinary acts of obedience. I'm going to say it until somebody says amen. If you haven't figured that out yet. Just acts of obedience begin the supernatural. You see, and here's the thing. I'll say this one more time before I move on. The good news is this. I am not exclusively responsible for the outcome of my obedience. In other words, when I have faith and I move in faith, you give. So let's, let, let, me, let me make that plain because I don't want you to miss this concept that I'm going to preach. When you give, and some of you have been giving liberally tonight and you've been giving and, and you've been putting your, your offerings in the plate out of faithfulness and generosity, when you give, you're not responsible for what happens after you give. You're only responsible to give. It's then God's responsibility to bless and multiply. So when you pray a prayer in faith, you're not responsible for that miracle to occur in your life. You're only responsible for praying the prayer of faith, continuing to believe, continuing to sing, continuing to hope. God takes on ownership of that reality after you give, after you pray, after you worship. You see, we possess so much more potential than what we've seen happen yet. And how do I know that? Because God is so much greater than we're allowing him to be through us. And what you and I say, it's a miracle. You know, that's only a combination of God or our ordinary ingredients and God's extraordinary abilities. That's a miracle. You say, but Brother Tisdall, I'm so unimpressive. I don't, I don't have much to offer. I'm, unqual I'm unqualified. Good. Because God performs the most impressive feats through the most unimpressive people. It's the truth. And, and you see, faith has to open your eyes to see the potential who's serving of serving a God who's already working on your behalf. Bringing about change in your personal life, in this church, in the future uh, of, of your children, bringing about change is never accidental. But change is a result of intention and focus. Miracles are not accidental. No one receives the Spirit accidentally. The two that received the Spirit today responded to an altar invitation. Then they asked God to forgive their sins because they felt pricked in their spirits. But that is because they responded and in their response, God responded. So the miraculous begins by intention. It's not accidental. You don't get a miracle because you happen to be in the house of God tonight. You don't receive a miracle accidentally because you came to the house of God and we sang the right song. Miracles are a result of pursuit and purpose, desire and hunger. For blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and they shall be filled. You see, your vision can't ever, your faith can't ever be limited to who you are or what you think you can do. Because again, we're only chiefly responsible of walking in obedience, walking in faith. God is responsible for providing the supernatural. We do the natural, God adds the super to it. And so the size of your vision, so let me tell you something else. So listen, your vision isn't limited to who you are or what you think you can accomplish. And the size of your vision is not determined by who God is. That cannot be, so that cannot be the determining factor by who God is. Because who God is is irrelevant to you. The size of your faith is directly connected for how big you believe God to be. 
It doesn't matter how great God is. It matters how big you believe God to be. How great you believe Him to be. That's why Hebrews 11 and 6 said without faith it's impossible to please Him. And that verse would be overly intimidating if it didn't explain itself. Because, but thankfully, Hebrews 11 and 6 qualifies what it means by the type of faith that's necessary to please God. Otherwise, it says without faith, you can't please Him. And all of us have struggled with faith. All of us wrestle with God's power, God's authority. But then the writer of Hebrews 11 and 6 defines what type of faith is required to please God. The writer goes on to say, He that cometh to God must believe he is. The first fundamental aspect of faith that pleases God is that you believe in his reality. That you believe in his existence. That you believe that he is. He is what is God. Every person I was to ask in here would have a different revelation of what is God. Some would say he is healer. Some would say he is help. Some would say he is rescue. Some would say he is a problem solver. He is a provider. He is peace. He is strength. And all of us have a different definition from what God is. That's why God had such a hard time defining himself when Moses asked him, who are you? He said, I am the I am. I am whatever I need to be whenever I need to be it. I am whatever's necessary for wherever you are. I am a blank check. I am any question you will ever ask. I am the solution to every problem you will encounter. I am self-existent, self-revealing, self-sustaining. I am that I am. I am whatever is necessary for wherever you are on your journey with me. If I need to be a cloud in the day to keep the burning sun off of you, if I need to be a fire at night to drive away the ravenous beast and keep you warm in the cold desert I am whatever's necessary I'm water from the rock I'm manna from heaven I'm quail when you get tired of bread I'm whatever's necessary and that's the first fundamental of faith that pleases God you must believe that he is and then the second required fundamental is that you must believe that he is a rewarder Now, I could go back and tell you that the the actual definition of the word is, is this. The actuality of reality. That's what it looks like. Look it up in Webster's if you want to fact check me. The actuality of reality. That's what it means. In other words, it means I is what I say I is. That's why it's improper for you to say it because we are not what we declare ourselves to be. We exist in this plane only. The word is means it's past, present, and the future. Is. No wonder the scripture says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. It's always been a strong tower. The name of the Lord will always be a strong tower. It is the actuality of reality. It exists. So if you're going to please God, you've got to believe he is God no matter what. He's God no matter where. No wonder David said, if I fly on the wings of the morning, I can't escape. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I ascend into the heavens, you're there. I can't go anywhere you're not. Because God is. He fills all space. Uh, he controls all things. Romans 11 and 36 said, In him, of him, and through him are all things. How can you be lost when you serve a God like that? Because in him is all things. Of him is all things. And through him all things move. That's a good God. And you know what I love about him? He's, he's, all, he's not only that, he's curious about his own greatness. That's, I, it mystifies me because God said of himself, I, he said in Isaiah, he said, I am God all by myself. I am God alone. And beside me, there is none other. That means God searched through all the cosmos and stepped outside the borders of time and said, nobody but me. It's just me. I'm God all by myself. There's no one opposite me. There's no one beside me. There's no one like me. I am God. And then he went on to define what makes him God and you not God. For all of you confused about this. He said, I am God. I declare the end from the beginning. Who else can do that? I declare the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. I still have declared things that haven't come to pass, but they will because I'm God. And then I like what he says, and I'll do all my pleasure. Whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, I'm God, and nobody can stop it. 
He doesn't get elected. He doesn't get voted out. He's God. He doesn't share his power. There's nothing within him to affect change. Change causes two things. There are two things necessary for change, a cause and an effect. And there is no effect big enough to change God. And there is no cause within God or outside of God to manipulate who he is. He is God. So the size of your faith, your vision, your dreams, your prayers, it's not limited by how big God is because God is infinite. He has no borders. He has no structure. He has no body. He fills all space. God doesn't even exist in this universe. The universe exists within him. That's who he is. All created things exist within the being and the essence and the thought process of God himself. And so your prayers aren't big enough. Let me, let me give you a guarantee tonight. I'm going to give you a 100% guarantee. You ready? And you don't get very these, very many of these very often. But I will give you 100% guarantee. You ready? 100% of the prayers you don't pray won't get answered. 100%. If you don't ask them, it won't happen. So... Jesus even said it. You have not because you. Have you ever wondered what he meant by that? You have not because you ask not. Now, most of you probably won't come ask me for a million dollars tonight. Probably because you don't think I have it. You'd be right. But let's say you thought I had it. Another reason you may not ask me for the million dollars is you don't think I'll give it to you. Because you don't think you deserve it for me to let it go. Or perhaps another reason, perhaps you think you're worth it. And perhaps you think I got it. But you may not ask me because you may not think I'm the kind of person that'll let it go. So really, there's only three reasons. Either you don't believe I possess the resources, you don't believe you're worth the resources, or you don't believe I'm the kind of individual who will let go of the resources. That's it. You have not because you ask not. If you believe God is your answer... Why not ask the question? If you believe God has the resources necessary, why not pray the prayer? Is it then because we don't feel like we, we deserve where we're at and we're wrestling with this issue and we're fighting this pain, this infirmity, this problem, because, and, and we deserve it? Is it because, or, or do we unsure that God would give it to us because of who we are? Because it's an identity crisis either with us or an identity crisis about God. So I'll say it again. You see, without Jesus, we're, we are completely incapable of doing anything of eternal value. Without God. And the size of your faith is not determined exclusively by who God is. It's determined by who you think God is. Because if it was determined by God who God is, there'd be no global poverty. There would be no incurable cancer. The scope and the impact of your faith is directly determined by who you believe God to be. And your belief about who God is defines every component of your personal spiritual life. The conundrum of faith is this. The conundrum of faith. Faith has everything to do with you. Say that. Say, faith has everything to do with me. And faith has nothing to do with you at all. That's the conundrum. Faith has everything to do with me. I gotta believe in faith. I gotta give in faith. I gotta worship in faith. I gotta serve in faith. I gotta repent in faith. I gotta pray in the Spirit in faith. But yet, faith has nothing to do with me. Because when I pray in faith, and I ask in faith, and I believe in faith, I can't make it happen. So, although it is pivotal to my success spiritually, it's out of my hands. That's faith. Let me, let me tell you something about how the gifts of the Spirit work. The gifts of the Spirit of this, it comes in bits and pieces. Little by little. Here a little, there a little. And if anyone ever tries to tell you your full future, they're robbing you of your future, and we walk not by sight, by faith. Faith is a necessary component of your walk with God. And yet faith simultaneously has nothing at all to do with you. Because once you release it in faith in prayer, it's up to God who is responsible to answer your prayer of faith. And that's the beauty of faith. Once I pray it, it's up to God to respond. 
So then the challenge that you and I face, don't stop believing, don't stop praying, don't stop asking, don't stop pressing. And then what happens is the righteous judge avenges speedily. But all too often we settle for the lowest common denominator of faith. Hebrews 11.33 says this. I, 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 I didn't give y'all, I, I gave them some scriptures, but I have preached stuff that I haven't given them all night. But watch this. Watch this. Hebrews 11 and 33. If you can get this one, put it up. I didn't give you this. Who through faith, this is what the scripture says, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames. I'm not quoting from the King James. Escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle, who routed foreign armies. Keep going. We're on 34 now. You ready? All of that that we just read, is a history lesson until you have the right biblical picture of God. Great men and women of God don't have some special, special supernatural DNA. And what makes them unique, like that list we just read, has very little to do with them. They're no different. They're plagued by fear, f frightened by insecurities, they're riddled with hesitations, and they're plagued by sin. What makes people like that world changers? Stopping the mouths of lions, routing foreign armies, speaking words, and creation occurring. What makes them different is this. They believe that their God is someone you can risk your reputation for. They believe that their God is someone worth taking a risk for. And what they believe about their God drives them to settle for nothing less than extraordinary faith, extraordinary giving, extraordinary worship. What you believe about your God will directly determine the legacy of faith in your family, in your children, and in your grandchildren. What you believe about God will determine how you impact the world in which you're placed. That's it. Some of you may never preach in Swaziland. Some of you may never travel the world as I travel the world. But the world in which your place deserves you to operate uh, in extreme faith. You see, people who make the fewest assumptions get the most miracles. Let me say it again. People who make the fewest assumptions get the most miracles. Joshua did not assume the sun could not stand still. Elisha refused to believe that iron axe heads can't float. Mary ignored the fact that virgins don't get pregnant. And Peter refused to assume that he could not walk on water. The people that assume the least have the most miraculous lives. And as you grow more and more in faith, you're supposed to make less and less assumptions. So let me challenge you. Leave all the definitions behind. Don't drown in them. There's really only two types of decisions when you're serving God. There are decisions made out of fear and there are decisions made out of faith. And fear-based decisions rarely end up in a miracle. Mark 10, he had to make a decision. Do I sit by the side of the road? And if you read it in Mark 10 and verse 46, it says this, and as Jesus went into Jericho and came out of Jericho, blind Bartimaeus sat by the highway side begging. And he has to make a decision. What he does not know is that in two weeks, Jesus will give his life on a cross. What he does not know, we have the benefit of the historical record, but what he does not know is that Jesus will never enter Jericho again. This is it. The three and a half years of evangelistic ministry of Christ is finished. He knows none of this. All the man named Bartimaeus knows is that he hears something that sparks belief in his spirit. And he senses, this is my moment. If he misses this moment, he's blind the rest of his life. There is no miracle for him. But he has to correlate what he hears with what he believes. And, and it's pivotal. You understand what, what he hears and what he believes. Because he begins to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And, and we like to preach, well, it was his praise. And they didn't like his praise. And they didn't like his noise. But Jesus is surrounded by a throng everywhere he goes. It's not his praise they're trying to silence. It's his revelation. 
Thou son of David is only used five times in the Bible and it is reserved exclusively for the Messiah. Thou son of David. It means the Messiah. So what this man is screaming in this pivotal juncture of Jesus' ministry when, when all the Herodians uh, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming against Jesus and there's so much anger. Because let me tell you something about Jesus. You either loved him or you didn't. There wasn't middle ground with him. You were either on his team or you were on the opposite team. You were either in love with Christ and a follower of the Christ or you rejected him wholeheartedly. You just couldn't find any middle ground. And so this man on the side of the road begins to scream, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, Messiah. Jesus, one that's been promised. Jesus, uh, come to save us from our sin. Let me tell you, the world isn't uncomfortable with your worship. You're raising your hands, you're clapping, you're dancing, you're doing your little jigs in the aisle, you're talking in tongues. doesn't intimidate this Christian world, and it doesn't even uh, intimidate an unbelieving world. They've seen enough charismatic style worship, they're comfortable with it. But what they are uncomfortable with is what Jesus said, you would be hated for my namesake. The revelation that you possess that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh for the salvation of our sins overwhelms people. And so what the Jewish people are uncomfortable with that they're trying to silence is his revelation to the identity. This is not just a good healer. This is the one sent to save us from our sins. This is who Isaiah prophesied, who Ezekiel prophesied, who Jeremiah prophesied, and he is screaming it. And the more they try to silence his revelation, the louder he gets. He has to make a fear or a faith decision. Do I, in fear, stop crying out because I, I've stirred up some people's anger? Or do I, in faith, keep screaming? Do I, in fear, get silent uh, because I don't understand everything that's going on? After all, I can't see. Or do I just keep yelling? And he just kept screaming. Because the decisions you make that will determine your legacy of faith, they're either based in fear or they're based in faith. Does he allow the labels that others have placed on his life to define him? Does he cry out louder? Does he to get more violent in his worship when he feels the negativity and the cynicism of the people that are watching him worship? What does he do? Fear or faith? Does he take the risk of rejection and call his name again? Which decision is it? Mark 5, she spent all she had. She's nothing better but rather growing worse. She has suffered the indignities and the cruelty of the current medical society. She has been everywhere to get a cure. Evidently, she's a woman of considerable financial means because the scripture said she has spent all that she had. And she has to make a fear or a faith decision. Do I push through the crowd? Now, it's important you know that according to Leviticus, she's unclean. Because she is hemorrhaging from her female parts. She is considered unclean. Anyone she touches, she defiles. They have to go to the priest and be cleansed before they can go make temple sacrifice or worship in the synagogue. Anyone she touches. No wonder. Can you imagine? So her disease isn't just making her weak because of the loss of blood. Her disease has caused her to be an outcast. If she's married, no relationship with her husband. If she has kids, she can't hold her kids, or she violates and makes them unclean. She, if you sit in a chair she sat in, you're unclean. If you ate from a dish she prepared food from, you're unclean. If you laid down on the bed where she laid down, you're unclean. So this woman has lived with a stigma that she's unclean. She's been banished from the worship experience for many years. She's outside the community of faith, but she heard it was Jesus, and she came in the press behind and said, if I but touch his clothes. There's no scriptural precedent for grabbing on Jesus' garments. She pushes through the press, and everybody's got to deal with something. 
We all have to deal with attitudes and thought processes and fears and unbeliefs and hesitations. But she pushes through and grabs on him. That's why it's so important when he turns and says, who touched me? They said, what do you mean, who touched me? He said, when the unclean touched me, virtue flew out of my body. When she touched me, I wasn't defiled. She was cleansed. There's nothing that you carry that's going to defile Jesus Christ. Uh, anyone in this room can touch him. No matter how dirty, no matter how sinful, no matter how much failure, no matter how much difficulty in your life you all can reach him but you know my favorite part of this miracle is that she doesn't even ask permission that's my favorite part she doesn't say if I touch his garment and it's his will he'll make me whole you know it's this obligatory ad idiom that we put on all of our prayers Lord heal my body if it be your will I'm frightened that's more of a crutch so we're not disappointed than our true submission to the will of God. Lord, if it be your will, save my kids. He's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to eternal life. You don't have to pray that way. It's God's will for your whole family to be saved. Uh, Acts chapter 16 said you and your whole household should be saved. Uh, you don't got to put that on the back end of a prayer. If it's God's will, heal my body. He took stripes on his back uh, for the iniquities uh, and the sufferings of your flesh. It is God's will that you be saved, that you be healed, that you be delivered, that you be cleansed. We still suffer under the same misconception they had in John 9. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Uh, we're still fighting that false doctrine. I must have this because I deserve it. Because my daddy didn't live right. My mama didn't live right. I made a bunch of choices. Jesus said, neither he nor his parents, uh, but that the glory of God might be revealed in him. It's God's will for you to have a miracle right now. But the miracle is directly proportionate to what you believe about your God. you got to believe he wants to heal you. you got to believe he wants to save you. If you don't believe when you repent of your sins, it doesn't work. If you don't believe when you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're just wet. If you don't believe when you ask God to fill you with the Spirit, you will not receive the Spirit. That's why the Bible says, confess with the mouth, believe in your heart, and you shall be saved. Because faith is a necessary component to salvation. Likewise, faith is a necessary component to the miraculous. So this woman says, if I touch, I shall be whole. You know why some people don't worship? You don't believe it matters. You know why some people don't tithe? You don't believe it matters. You know why some people don't give generously in the offering? You don't believe it matters. You know why some people don't live separate than sin? You don't believe it matters. Because if you ever get convinced it matters, like this woman was, she said, if I touch, I shall be. Then when you give, you go, if I give, he's going to bless. If I praise, he's going to flow over my life. If I pray, he's going to answer. If I ask, he's going to respond. If I, if I worship, God's going to settle over my home. If you're ever convinced, so, so the issue is not, hear me clearly, the, the miracle began when she became convinced. It didn't begin when she touched. The miracle began when she started her pursuit. If I but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She set the parameter on her own miracle. She said, if I can get through that crowd of people and I can just grab his, hit the bottom of his robe, everything's going to be different. I wonder what would happen if we had that kind of audacious, extraordinary faith. We said, if I just get to the house of God and I can get in there and grab Sister Susie's hand and do a little jig at the altar, whew, everything's going to be fine before I leave the house of God. I, I, I wish you could just believe that way with me. If I could just get to church and hear the preacher preach, it's going to break something off my family. If I could just get to the altar, something's going to shift in my relationship with God. If I could just pray one more time in the house of God, if I could just run those Isles. but we don't have the type of conviction she had in Mark 5 and I'll say it again it's a fear or a faith decision if I push through the crowd and I defile everybody fear or faith I've spent all I had why is this going to work fear or faith I have nothing else left fear or faith because the decisions you make about God are based in one or two camps a faith based decision or a fear based decision 
She had to make a decision. Do I allow the ceremonial law to isolate me from the one who could bring me an answer? Do I worry about the people that I make unclean as I make my way through the crowd? Do I fear the rejection of Jesus Christ when I grab his clothes? What if it doesn't work? It's a fear decision. It's a faith decision. She said, Lord, my daughter lied at home sick. He said, you're a dog. Go away. She said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. Because it's a fear of faith decision. Can you imagine the decision she had to make just to approach the table? Just to know that she was a Samaritan, considered a, only half a Jew. Not, 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 not really uh, worthy enough to talk to him, to be around those men, to sit at his table, to even approach him. And so she just says, hey, my daughter's sick. Can you help me? He says, woman, you're a Samaritan. You're a dog. Go. She said, but wait, even the dogs get something. He said, I haven't seen this kind of faith anywhere. Because it's a fear of faith-based decision. I'll just declare to this house, I make a decision to grow. The decisions you make right now determine your future. We make fear-based decisions out of insecurity, out of a feeling of scarcity, out of giving away too much power to other people. Fear-based decisions only reap more fear, uncertainty, anger, hesitancy, anxiety. But faith-based decisions release the miraculous. Faith-based decisions release new possibilities. Faith-based decisions allow God to be strong in your life and show His glory. Faith-based decisions, they result in unimaginable miracles as God flexes His muscles and gets the glory. I'll tell you something I believe. It's a, it's a little bit controversial, but I'll just be honest with you. People come to me all over the country and say, say, Evangelist, would you pray with me? I go, what do you want me to pray with? Well, I'd rather not tell you. So you know what I say? No. I won't pray for that. They'll say, well, it's unspoken. Just, just, just hold my hand and pray about this unspoken request. I said, I won't pray for that. And this is why. And I explain it to them. How do I know I'm praying for something God needs to do in your life? How do I know I'm agreeing about something good? How do I know I'm asking God and partnering my faith with you about something that's going to be beneficial? Because what you're really saying is, I don't trust you enough to tell you my junk, so I'm not going to, I just want to be secretive here. Because we want miracles on the down low. We want to be cool. We don't want exposure. We don't want to scream as lame outside in a crowd. We don't want to be rejected at the table because we're less than a dog. Uh, oh, no. We don't want to cry out and push through the crowd and say, if I touch, because we want everything to be cool. We want God to give us a miracle, but we want to control the parameters. And if you've got to get a miracle, you've got to take a risk. You've got to be willing to risk ridicule. You've got to speak up. You've got to be willing to look a little silly. You've got to be willing to step out on a limb. Never let the practical get in the way of the possible. Don't be so rational that you rationalize the supernatural. Give yourself time tonight to wonder what it is God could do supernaturally in your life. What could happen in your life right now if you move just slightly in a faith direction? What would your life be like if you start praying the prayers you stop praying? that you're afraid to ask if you made faith-based decisions. You know, when you, when you start making faith-based decisions, you feel it. You feel like, whew, something's going to happen. You just can't help it. It begins to grow inside of you because a faith-based decision becomes the story of your life later. Later. Because you make a decision in faith today to prayer of faith, and later you say, hey, Brother Tisdale, I, I, it was on that Sunday night uh, in, in the month of March, and, 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 and I made that decision, and, and hey, it's two years later, but my dad came and got the Holy Ghost. You see, faith-based decisions are the story of your life later. But in fear-based decisions, you're worried that if you make the decision, things will turn out in a way you can't control. Des define your life by the faith you're willing to pray. You will never pray a prayer that backs God into a corner. You will never ask God to do something that's beyond his ability. You will never have a moment that your faith surpasses God's capacity to respond.
There's nothing God can't do tonight. There's nothing God can't fix tonight. And if you follow Jesus long enough, you're going to move into the supernatural. If you profess his name long enough, he's going to challenge you to move into the supernatural. Miracles by their own definition are a violation of natural laws. They're not logical. They're not rational. But our natural tendency is to try to explain away what we don't understand. But don't you dare let what you can't understand keep you from asking uh, what is possible in God. Just because you can't explain it, don't you dare not pray it. Jesus said it this way, John 14 and 12. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works of than these shall he do. And whatsoever, verse 13, ye ask in my name, that will I do. Don't rationalize that verse. Don't, don't tone it down. You know, Thomas Jefferson wrote a Bible. It's called the Jeffersonian Bible. And when Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders of this country, wrote the Bible, he removed all references to the supernatural from the Bible. So, so for an example, the man with the withered hand that Jesus teaches about the Sabbath, and then he heals the man with the withered hand in the synagogue. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Into the Jeffersonian Bible, Jesus teaches about the Sabbath in the synagogue. The man stands up with the withered hand and leaves with the withered hand. In the Jeffersonian Bible, the woman with the issue of blood is not healed. In the Jeffersonian Bible, Jesus is still in the grave. He keeps all the moral teachings and the ethical concepts that Jesus teaches, but he removes all the supernatural references and all the divine interaction with humanity. I won't serve a God like that. I refuse to worship in a church like that where we strip the miraculous out of the church and we just have a moral code. I refuse uh, to allow my faith to be manipulated by the rationale and the unbelief of people. I want a supernatural God that defies explanation. I want a God that I can't articulate, that I can't explain. But he's always got some sovereign surprise up his sleeve. He's always up to something and he's never backed in a corner and we're never out of options. That's the kind of God I serve. So simply put, there is a human component in every miracle. And sometimes, God will not part the waters until you step in the Jordan. Sometimes you have to wade into the Jordan and dip seven times. Only God can heal leprosy. Only God could deliver Naaman. And Naaman would have forfeited the miracle if he had not positioned himself in the river in repeated obedience. Sometimes the supernatural is one step and the water parts. Sometimes you got to dip until the leprosy's gone. Sometimes it's tenacious, stubborn faith. Sometimes you refuse to be flummoxed, overwhelmed. You won't quit. You don't give up. Let me make it very clear. The God of the Bible can do whatever he pleases whenever he wants. And what pleases God is to do the supernatural in this place right now. That's what pleases God. He's the same God that leveled Jericho's walls without a battle. He's the same God that created every star with simply four words. Let there be light. That's his God. I love it. They mystify us and God summed it all up with just six words. And he made the stars also. That's it. We spend billions of dollars with unending questions about what's out there. And God just says... And he made the stars also. That's it. Hear me. He still turns water to wine. He still opened blinded eyes. He still removes cancers. You've come too late to tell me it doesn't happen. Just last year, I saw stage four cancer removed five separate times. I want this house to hear me. God is still in the miracle working business, but you have to give him the opportunity. You have to pray faith-fueled prayers. You have to live a life. I, I have this statement written on my library. It's in my office in Dallas, Texas, and I look at it almost every day, and that's this, it right here. Live a life that can only be explained by a God who is infinitely greater than you are. That means I'm going to pray prayers. You, you, you see, you see if, you can, if you can do it, it's not a prayer anyway. There's no faith in it if you can make it happen. If you can apply for a job and get a better job, there's no faith in that prayer because you're trying to create your own answer. You've got to pray prayers that you can't produce the result for. You've got to ask big things 
The earth is the Lord's. I heard him quote it earlier. And the fullness thereof. And all that dwell therein. That's Psalms 24, Psalms 89. The heavens are his. That's what he says in 89 and 11. The earth is thine and the fullness thereof. 1 Corinthians 10 and 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all God's. You know, there are, it is estimated there are 100,000 quadrillion, vision trillion atoms in the observable universe. It's a big number. It's 10 with 82 zeros. That's what it is. 10 with 82 zeros. That's how many they believe are atoms in the observable universe. It's a lot of atoms. God can heal them. God can start them. God can stop them. God can curse them. But every single atom is obedient to the words of God. Every one of them. God controls them and he owns them. He can multiply them. He can curse them. He can restore a withered hand. He can curse a barren fig tree. God made it all. God controls it all. God is in charge of every facet of your life right now. Do you believe that? See, God's word is the kinetic energy that controls every molecule in the universe. And yet every atom that exists, A-T-O-M, was affected by the fall of man. When Adam, A-D-A-M, ate from the tree of life, the law of entropy was introduced. That means the law of death was introduced into the equation of creation. And now metal rusts, food rots, people die, sickness comes, cells mutate. Stars collapse. It's the law of entropy. But there is no atom that's in your body. There is no wave beating against your boat that doesn't obey the word of God. Not the antibodies in your bloodstream that fight off infection. Not the enzymes in your liver that detox and and digest. None of them. All of them are subservient to the command of God himself. So I wish someone in this house would pray a big prayer. I wish you'd ask a big request. That's what Joshua did. He refused. He refused to believe that what God said wouldn't come to pass. Because God said, I will deliver them into your hand. I will deliver them He spent 40 years enduring the consequences of other people's bad decisions. That's what Joshua did. That should have been enough to derail anybody's faith. Yet Joshua doesn't give in. Joshua doesn't flinch. Moses died. Joshua's his successor. And before Joshua, they're migrants living hand to mouth. But afterward, after Joshua, they inherit the exceedingly good land that God promised And there's an exceedingly good promise for someone in this room right now tonight. The Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 10 and 8, Fear not, I've given them into your hand. And so Joshua, in his repeated obedience, is fighting them. And they run out of daylight. And Joshua has the audacity to say, God, thanks for that graphic. God, stop the sun. The Midianites think, whoo! Night's coming, and we're about to get a break from this whipping. Most people would have been content with what God had already done. You had routed the enemy. They were vanquished. But God told him, I'll give them all to you. You'll win. And Joshua said, God, we're not finished. You know, you got to be careful that when God starts blessing you, you don't stop believing for the next level. And Joshua says, just when those Amorites, they're can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. It's getting dark. We're going to win. Joshua says, God, would you hold the sun so I can finish this, what, this victory? Would you just give me a little more time? Would, would you just stop the sun uh, from going down? So God says, you need another day to finish this victory? Because remember, there's always a human component in every miracle. And so your miracle tonight begins when you start the God component, but you keep doing the human component. Uh, and you say, God, just give me a little bit more time to see this come to pass. God, just do this right now miraculously in my life. I, I'll keep giving. I'll keep working. I'll keep singing. And there's never been a day like it or a day since. But God heard the request of Joshua because Joshua refused to assume that God wouldn't give him complete victory. Stand to your feet all over this house.
There's a lot I could describe about how God handled that situation. And I just believe it very simply that the same God who created the cosmos and ordered all that governs it intervened on that day in history because a man of God asked him to. God still desires to make the sun stand still over your family. God still desires to bring your promises to pass. So I have preached tonight 45 minutes and 46 seconds. That is exactly 15 minutes longer than I intended. But I'm convinced that if somebody would find the audacity to ask God for the supernatural, God would do it tonight. If you'd set the parameters, if you'd say, if I do this, you'll do that. If you'd declare the impossible, if you refuse to allow your fear-based decisions to manipulate your faith, and if you just start making some faith choices, God could do a miracle right now in your life. Do you believe me? So if you're ready for God to do a miracle, physical, spiritual, financial, it doesn't matter to me what it is, come to this altar right now. And here's where we're going to start. I need three men that believe God will touch Pastor Wolf and his body to slip up there beside him on the platform right now. There goes two of them. I need one more. Well, we got five. Keep going. It's all right. Now, just let me coach you, men, as you're heading toward Pastor Wolf. We're not praying if it be your will. We're asking God to stop the sun, to do the supernatural, to do the impossible, to clear up the infection. But listen, don't just pray about the easy infection. I want you to pray about the neuropathy that's tormenting his feet and his hands. I want you to pray that God would give strength to his heart and his lungs. You ready? Just reach your hand that way and pray the prayer of faith. Oh, yeah. The rest of you, reach your hand up there and start praying with me right now. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're not afraid to ask hard prayers because we want you to get the glory. We speak against the affliction in his lungs. We speak against the neuropathy in his hands, his feet. We pray, Lord, against the weakness in his heart and his lungs. In the name of Jesus, you heal James Wolfe by the power and the authority of the word of God. Let strength come into his body. If you've done it before, do it again, God. You stop the sun, stop the disease, stop the affliction. I curse every bit of fear. I curse every bit of anxiety and torment that's working against his faith. I pray against the despair over a body not working right. The devil is a liar and the father of every lie. We speak healing over him in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, that's it. Lay your hand on him, men. In the name of Jesus, speak to the affliction. Lean close. Put your hand on him and say, In the name of Jesus. That's it. Pray with me, believers. Pray in the Holy Ghost with me right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Uh, go ahead, God. Stop the affliction. If we do this, you'll respond. Uh, well, the miracle begins with our faith and with our hope and our conviction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, right now I speak healing over your body, Pastor. Come on, that's it. Pray the prayer of faith with me. Receive strength in your body, James Wolf. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who else needs a miracle in this house? Put your hand in the air and hold it up. Put your hand in the air and just hold it up. You need God to do a miracle, a physical miracle. We're just, we're just going to stay in healing right now. If you need a healing, put your hand in the air right now. Now I want you to turn. Uh, keep your hand up, but I want you to turn and look for somebody around you that's got their hand up. Look for somebody around you. Make sure they see your hand because you're going to lay hands and pray for each other right now. You're going to pray. Here's what you're going to say with me. You ready? Say it. Say, by the authority of the name of Jesus, by the sovereignty of the word of God, by the power of the Holy Ghost in me, I command your body to be healed in the name of Jesus. Oh, say it like you mean it. Come on, pray it. We have not because we ask not. I need somebody, while you're praying for them, you're asking God to do a miracle for each other right now. You're praying for yourself and you're praying for them. You're saying, God, stop the sun, remove the pain, bring healing, bring deliverance, bring us a breakthrough. Every heart condition, every blood disorder, every backache, uh, every mental fatigue, uh, every bit of it, God, every bit of fibromyalgia, every bit of muscle weakness, every bit of nerve pain, every cancer, every demonic diagnosis, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, that's it, men. Lay your hand on each other for a few minutes. Huh? Be healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. You got to ask for a miracle. 100% of the prayers you don't pray won't be answered. You got to ask them. You got to profess them. You got to declare them. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that's it. Yeah, I call this body to order by the authority of the Word of God. Every cell obey the Word of the Lord. I call the chaos into order in the name of Jesus. Ah, yeah, that's it, that's it, that's it. Now, do something with me. Grab the person you're praying for for a miracle by the hand. And I want you to say this with me. Say, every cell, obey the word of the Lord. I call you into order in the name of Jesus. Come on, say it. Just take it all the way down to the cellular level. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Every cell, obey the word of the Lord. I release healing in the name of Jesus. We release deliverance in the name of Jesus. We release strength in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Every physical affliction, every spirit of infirmity, every pain, every attack, be gone in the name of Jesus. Receive order, divine order by the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. by the power in the name of the Lord
If you need a miracle in your family, put your hand up right now. See, I gotta have a miracle in my family. Maybe it's your personal relationship with your spouse, or maybe it's with your kids, or with your parents, or, or with a relative, but there's a family. You need a breakthrough in your family. Just put your hand up right now. You need God to reverse some error and release some healing, and restore faith all over this house. Grab somebody's hand that has their hand up. And we're going to pray for each other's families right now. It doesn't happen unless we ask. So if they've got their hand up, you know to ask for their family right now. I want you to ask for yours and theirs. You ready? Pray. Right now, God, every spirit of error, every fear-based decision that's being made by us and in our families, uh, release faith in the name of Jesus. Uh, we rebuke every spirit uh, in the name of Jesus, every bit of doubt and unbelief, uh, every bit of fear and confusion, uh, every spirit of error and doubt uh, in the name of Jesus. Restore families, uh, restore marriages, restore parental relationships, uh, restore siblings relationships in the name of Jesus in the name it doesn't happen unless we pray it it doesn't happen unless we ask for it in the name of Jesus work in our families work in our homes Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that's it. Pray for your families. Just a little bit more. Hallelujah. Oh, that person you've been praying with, pray for an emotional breakthrough, for a healing spiritually. Pray for it right now, for renewal of faith, for great faith to overtake their family, for reckless faith, uh, for faith that's willing to ask a son to stand still, to sweep into their family. Come on, pray against doubt. Uh, pray against unbelief. Pray for great faith right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead, put your hand on them, pray for blessing. Pray for financial breakthrough. Pray for provision. Pray for opportunities. Pray for success. In the name of Jesus. That's it, ask for it. Ask for it. Ask for it. Uh, don't you get to heaven and have an indictment against you that God would have done it, but you didn't ask for it. Uh, you didn't ask God to save your family. You didn't ask God to fill your kids with the Spirit. You didn't ask God for a breakthrough financially. You didn't ask God for a healing in your body. Come on, you got to ask in this house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.